Good morning. I hope you are all ready to start with the second part of the session on uh, Vitola MC. I hope you enjoyed the uh, evening in Cologne yesterday and you had a bit of time to go to the Christmas market. So this morning we will have uh, four EASA colleagues presenting their work on the future MC for VTOL. We will get started by Aiko Dune from EASA on load factor in emergency landing and crash worthiness. Then a quite interesting uh, subject presented by Emily Lewis on interpretation of single failure criteria for structure, which is a new element introduced in a, a special condition VTOL. Then burst strikes combining the airframe and engine approach. It's a joint presentation by Erdris, Erenson, and Regis Rosotto. And the last presentation before the coffee break will be by Jean-Christophe Lamy. It's on HIRF and lightning for small VTOL. So let's get started. Heiko, please. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Heiko Dune, structures expert in the VTOL department and um, responsible for the AMC for crash worthiness and emergency landing for VTOL. Um, so to get started, a little overview. Um, the crash worthiness and emergency landing is mainly covered in uh, two paragraphs in the special condition VTOL. On the one hand, we have the emergency conditions, which mainly deal about the loads and load factors the occupant, pro the occupant could experience in a minor crash landing. And uh, then we have the fire protection, which is covering mainly the fire initiation and fire propagation, but um, also includes um, the hazard after uh, um, an emergency landing. That's why it's also um, in this presentation, I will mainly go on to the post-crash fire or post-crash hazard um, topics. Um, so to get started with uh, a little um, overview of the two main uh, paragraphs we have for emergency landing. So it's the 2270 um, emergency landing. Um, where it basically has the requirement to protect each occupant in the um, VTOL against serious injury when making use of uh, safety features such as uh, seat belts. Um, the person um, experienced the ultimate static loads um, that are likely to occur during a minor crash landing and um, he should not be injured by any items of mass flying around uh, in case of an emergency landing. Um, the second topic that is included there is that it also has to include um, dynamic conditions, which is uh, mainly then focusing on the dynamic uh, seat testing. And um, it also includes the baggage compartment that there should no not be any hazard um, due to any items shifting or um, any items damaging any essential equipment that goes through or right next to the baggage compartment. Uh, the second um, topic is uh, I, I put here some, some keywords on the fire protection um, paragraph and uh, I only will in the rest of the presentation focus on the survivable emergency landing but um, to be complete, uh, um, it's about minimizing the risk of fire initiation and minimize the risk of fire propagation. Um, there also in future will be some AMC about um, the fire protection in, in general, but um, due to uh, time constraints, we uh, focus first on the more important things and uh, we think that's definitely the survivable emergency landing post-crash fire, post-crash hazard issue. So what's the basis for uh, the crash worthiness and uh, um, for the crash worthiness AMC for the special condition VTOL? And uh, as a basis, we take the CS27. Why? Well, normally a VTOL is operated in a similar um, way uh, like a rotorcraft. It uh, takes off vertically this, uh, so the, the operation is quite similar, but at the same time, it will be more likely to be more diverse. You have a wider speed range uh, of VTOLs compared to uh, conventional helicopters. And um, there might also be uh, some VTOLs which, has a, which have a CTOL landing capability, so a conventional takeoff and landing capability like a, well, a general aviation aircraft. 
So uh, that's why we base the AMC um, on CS27, namely it's a 561, um, talking about uh, emergency landing conditions, 562, talking about the dynamic emergency landing conditions, and including the 952, which is um, the fuel system crash resistance, which uh, I will also go a bit more in detail. And in some paragraphs, or we have, we took also into account the CS23 world, because if you are, uh, uh, if you have a CTOL capability, then uh, in some cases the, um, the load factors might be higher, especially the forward load factors. So before going into the real AMC, which uh, we, we drafted and which we will uh, bring out in, um, soon, I go a bit in the history of the CS27 crash worthiness, where it comes from, and uh, mainly all of it um, is uh, based on one paper um, published in uh, 85 by the FAA called Analysis of Rotor Crash Test Dynamic Crash Dynamics for Development of Improved Crash Worthiness Design Criteria. Basically what it has done is it took um, 1,300 um, helicopter accidents in the mid to late 70s and analyzed how did they crash with what impact velocities, what attitude, what are typical impact scenarios. And it did not look into uh, how can we mitigate or how can we, can we make rotorcraft safer. It was just a study stating how do helicopters rotorcraft crash. And uh, based on this study, um, then the um, 561 and 562, the emergency landing condition load cases, were um, developed. 562 was introduced in uh, late, uh, late 80s. Um, the dynamic seat condition based on this paper, the 561 loads, the static loads were increased due to, based on this paper and also the 952 is uh, taking the, all the reference data out of this uh, paper. Um, what does this paper says? Well, it mainly focuses, or what, what for the emergency landing conditions we developed is important, is um, the impact velocity, which we have here on the left side, and the cumulative <coughs> frequency of occurrences. And uh, here, did I do that? No. <laughs> um, <clears throat> What we can see here basically is uh, how, how high are the impact velocities um, and how often do they occur. And then the group who developed the, nine, uh, the 561 and 562, the emergency landing conditions, had to put up some safety target. And they said, okay, we want to cover 95% of the crashes. So uh, what they did, they, they took the 95% curve on that side and said, okay, it's the 95th percentile is 26 foot per second, so if we want to cover 95% of the accidents, we come up with 26 foot per second. <clears throat> At the end in the rule, they then ask for 30 foot per second, 9.1 meter per second um, impact speed for a dynamic seat test. Um, this was in the late 80s, and then uh, shortly, well, shortly after, a couple of years after that, um, the fuel tank crash worthiness was introduced, the 952. And again, <clears throat> it was thought about what will be the safety objective for a um, fuel tank crash resistance. And um, there it was said, well, we want to cover more than 99% of um, all helicopter crashes, so that we really ensure that um, if people survive an emergency landing, a crash landing, um, then we also don't want to take any risks of a post-crash fire hazard. We want to make sure that they can be uh, rescued. So those are basically the, the two layers we have for um, the impact speeds. And out of this, like, like I said, are those uh, three paragraphs developed. 561, 562 talks about a minor crash landing. Actually, the AMC material does that. It, it calls out for a minor crash landing, which 
is translated into a 30 foot per second impact velocity, which covers the 95%. On seat track level, seat attachment level, um, it should not, or it was, uh, um, it, it was meant that in typical rotorcraft designs with an impact velocity of 30 foot, you have approximately 30 G on the seat attachment level. Um, that's how it got into the 562 rule, so you should not, in the downward case, exceed uh, or you have to test to 30 Gs. And I think the most important point is the occupant must be able to evacuate themselves after this impact. So no serious injury, they have to walk out by themselves. Um, whereas the 952 talks about a totally different safety target. It's not called anymore a minor emergency crash landing, it's a survivable. And um, it exceeds the 99% curve we just uh, earlier see, the 99% um, survivable impact velocity to really make sure if you have a reasonable chance to uh, survive this um, emergency landing, you also want them to be safe and not um, create any hazard due to post-crash fire or some post-crash hazard. Um, and that's why uh, the 27952 came up with a 50-foot drop test height, which then translate in the impact velocity we saw on the, on the previous slide. Um, so I have now just three, four slides going a bit more into what we will bring out as an AMC for WeTOL. So um, the first one is based on the 561. The, um, give each occupant every reasonable chance of escaping serious injury. Those are the load factors taken out of the 27, CS27, with the exception of the forward load case for occupants and items within the cabin. There we step up to the 23 rule if you have conventional takeoff and landing capability. The second AMC um, we will we are, we are uh, implementing is the dynamic seat test. Again, we basically take it out of the um, CS27, where you have uh, two tests, where you have the two tests in, in all certification specification, one downward test, one forward test. They look all the same. The test one is uh, uh, to the vertical 30 degree uh, um, canted. Um, the second test is straightforward with a 10 degree pitch and roll. And uh, there we have this 30G downward from the rotorcraft world, and if you have a CTOL capability, the forward case will be more severe because traditionally they uh, have a, a higher impact speed forward. So there you have to do 26 instead of 18G. And um, all those comes along with a 10 degree pitch and roll um, of the seat tracks. Um, as it is written currently in the 27562. <clears throat> and uh, now for the fuel tank drop test, we try to uh, um, focus not only on fuel, because in the most of the VTOLs you will not have any liquid fuel, so we called it energy storage drop test which is based mainly on the 952 fuel system crash resistant which, as I said, should minimize um, the hazard to the occupant in an otherwise survivable crash landing. And uh, we kept basically the part for the liquid, for, this, for the classical fuel, but uh, we added also some, especially in the pass fail criteria, some topics for gaseous fuels, if you want to use fuel cells in the future, or solid batteries, as most of the VTOLs are using currently. <clears throat> We ask for self-insulation means if you have a crash. This is already now in the 952 and uh, will be also taken over for um, other energy storage kinds. And uh, for the electrical systems, we also think of having a manual insulation means um, in case of a crash or after a crash. So what does it, how does a test look like? Uh, it's basically the same test sub setup as you have for a liquid fuel, a classical fuel system. Um, you take the energy storage system, put it in a representative surrounding structure, whatever 
has an influence on the drop test should be included. Um, at least everything that could um, make the drop more severe should be included. But of course, also the surrounding structure has some damping capability, so uh, it might also be beneficial to put the surrounding structure in there. And this goes up to, you also can do a full-scale drop test um, for your energy storage system. You have to normally drop the entire storage system, except when you can um, clearly identify the most critical one, then you also will uh, be able to just uh, drop the most critical one in the surrounding structure and the rest you substantiate by um, comparison and, and stating that it's uh, um, less severe than the one you tested. Um, well, it must be filled or charged to the most critical uh, condition. For liquid fuel, it's normally uh, maximum uh, fuel in there. I expect it for uh, batteries and for uh, gases being the same, but uh, that needs to be defined. The drop height is 50.2 meter, which is 50 foot on a non-deformable surface. You must drop it freely and an impact in a horizontal position. You can deviate plus minus 10 degrees. Actually also coming out of this paper from the FAA out of the um, 80s. So the pass-fail criteria, um, the most important thing is no leakage of any flammable fluids, gases, vapors, whatever can be flammable should not leak. Um, if any liquids, gases, anything is harmful to the occupant, to the human, then it should not be in an occupied area or in the evacuation pass so that you give the occupants a chance to escape without uh, getting uh, or with protecting them from, from any harmful uh, substances. And uh, for if you have a pressurized energy storage system, you also like uh, gas cylinders, you also have to ensure that uh, they will not explode and you will not have any damage or endanger the occupants after uh, such an emergency landing by structural failure of these uh, pressurized cylinders. So uh, that's it. Um, those are the main three topics we have for the, for the emergency landing, um, which are coming from a classical fuel point of view, but uh, since this uh, this paper from the FAA is not focusing on any design or any kinds of fuel or seats or anything. They are just purely focusing on how does a classical or how does a rotorcraft crash. And based on this, um, we can derive uh, the means to protect the persons. And uh, that's why uh, we think this can be very well translated also in the world of batteries and fuel cells and whatever. Thank you.